back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. I would dance and be merry. Life would be a ding a dairy if I only had a brain. <laughs> Wayne, you're just knocking them out of the park today. If I only had a brain. Wizard of Oz, right? Yeah. Good stuff. All right. We're talking about personal injury law on the law show. We have Scott Stanley and Kevin Gurley here from Murphy Batista in downtown Vancouver. Now, being a car guy, I have to ask you, uh, gentlemen, about um, the uh, advancements we've had in car technology. Have you seen a reduction in personal injury cases because of things like forward collision warning, automatic braking, lane departure technology, lane assist i could go on and on all this new technology that's trickling into new cars you haven't seen it well uh, really? yeah we typically don't see the cases where uh, the accident didn't happen well, so there you go we, perfect <laughs> example yeah <laughs> we uh we haven't seen that yet but i do think that that is that's coming that the number of accidents is fortunately going to be reduced the uh, i suspect uh the stats will eventually show uh, especially with uh, the technology, and you would know, Zach, this better than I, the technology that prevents one vehicle from being able to rear-end another vehicle. Mm -hmm. I suspect that that's going to reduce in, in the next 10, 15 years the number of, of rear-end collisions in particular that we see. Um, I, I don't think it will... I think we're a long way from the, uh, the high-speed collisions, the intersection collisions. I think we're a long way from those being prevented. Uh, but the distracted driving collisions, somebody not paying attention, rear ending, rear ending somebody else. I think the technology is there and it's a matter of it being uh, working its way into the yeah, market. Yeah, because it's new technology and you need to have a newer car in order to have this. And my advice to anybody listening is if you're going to buy a brand new 2016 or 17 car, if that is available to you, that mm -hmm. forward collision warning system at least, get it. And my understanding is that more and more vehicles, it's not just the high-end vehicles now. I, I suspect it's going to be mandated the way mm -hmm. that um, uh, rear cameras are, are, are yeah. going to be mandated and all those sorts of things. We used to have about, like, in the, before we had, like, say in the early 90s, we'd have about 40,000 car accidents a year that injured people. Mm -hmm. And then ICBC had those great um, road safe campaigns. It was a really, ICBC spent money in a really good fashion on those things. You know, don't speed. They used to hire me. There you go. To do them. They were the driving well, tips with Zach Spencer. You oh, yeah. They stopped doing them. Why ICBC? <laughs> give me a call. <laughs> well, when they did that, and you, know, you can give you credit for this, Zach, the accident levels dropped from about 40,000 to 30,000. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's huge. That's, that's 25%. Massive. That's massive. Um, but then what happened, and there was also a cessation of drunk driving and an increase in seatbelt usage. So that was all good. But what's really trumped everything, a game changer, is the bloody distracted driving. Uh, it's and you can preach all you want. You can put a TV yep. or a radio ad on and say, yep. don't text while driving. But people, especially the young people, if they hear that text alert go off, they can't help themselves. Because I, I think most people really believe that it's dangerous when everybody else does it. But when I do it, it's it's okay because I'm just doing it when I'm stopped or I'm I'm doing it safely at an, at an okay time. And what we know is that, that it can't be done safely. Um, and I really think it's going to take um, the kind of social stigma that now fortunately attaches to drunk driving mm -hmm. to start attaching to uh, texting while driving or, or looking at your, your smartphone. Because if you're sitting downtown in traffic now and you are watching people's eyes, a third of them are not watching. I the call road. them crotch watchers. What <laughs> happened is it used to be able to look on your phone before the law was enacted and people would be looking at their phone and texting. Well, now what they do is they put it down between their legs and do it. So we have a generation of crotch watchers. They're dry to dry, but they're actually looking in between their legs at their phone. And, and people should hopefully start to realize that they're not fooling anybody. Yeah. That we know why they're looking down. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why, you know, I have had so many uh, interviews that I've uh, been a guest turning the tables here and people say to me you know what are we going to do to get people off their phones well the answer is actually the car manufacturers are making cars that will watch the road when you're not going to mm -hmm. and those are the autonomous or the semi-autonomous systems the automatic braking the lane keep assessed all of these things if you're going to be fooling around with your phone well at least the car can be alert for you one thing i i think i mean i have this experience i, I talk on the cell phone but on, through the the hands Bluetooth, free, yeah, yeah. yeah but what i find is when my kids and wife are in the car with me and I'm approaching an intersection, they'll, they'll stop talking. But when you're, they're in at the home and you're getting an edict to go get eggs and milk or go pick up so-and-so here, they're not there with you and they can't see what you see. And so they just talk right through it. And I personally find that very distracting. Well, they've, they've done studies and have shown that 
even just having a passenger in the passenger seat carrying on a conversation is is just as distracting as looking at your phone. So uh, driving, even with the radio turned up loudly, can be distracting. Right? Well, and there's also studies showing that that the distraction from looking at your phone and doing other things doesn't end the second your eyes leave it and go back to the road. That that your mind takes a number of seconds to catch up, mm-hmm. and that you are in fact still distracted. And I think you see that all the time with. Um, people, uh, people's eyes coming up and lurching forward because the vehicle and their peripheral vision started to move. I saw that accident happen. There was a woman yep. next to me reading a book. Uh, this is true. <laughs> reading a book. And I moved forward because my lane, and she lifted off and hit the, and wham, right into the Mercedes in front of her. She was yep. reading a book. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not a crime. <laughs> <laughs> Not a crime. Yeah, I wasn't on my electronic device. So, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're going to have some aids out there. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, here's another one. I'll throw you the, uh, um, the mayor of Vancouver, Mr. Bike Lane. Uh, have we seen urine personal injury, pedestrian accidents have they diminished and have bike accidents gone up because we have more, more cyclists on the road? I, I would say my experience is that the number of bike accidents have gone up. They tend to be more violent than car accidents because yeah. they don't have the armor. protection, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the pedestrian strikes in East Vancouver are as high as they've ever been. Why East Van? Well, it, it, well just downtown East Side. There are oh, a see, large yeah. number of pedestrian uh, strikes. There's a lot of people a milling about mm-hmm. and I... I we continue to see a lar- an alarming number of pedestrian strikes in that area. That's interesting. Yeah. So the bike, the, the, there's more bi- bicycle accidents. Uh, you know, when it's, you know, you know, bike to work week, I think yeah. it's like learn how to go to the hospital yeah. week yeah. is, I mean, it's a great idea. Don't get me wrong. But it, what it does is it encourages people to bike, which is great. Uh, but it also puts people on the road that aren't acutely aware of the dangers. I mean, might will make right. That car will win every time. And I so, had a I had a guy weaving in and out of traffic, and he was on a like a moped kind of thing, like a, a, a crappy little scooter, right? And he's weaving in and out, and he's threading the needle between me and the car next to him. I rolled down the window and I said, "I will always win. <laughs> yeah. You are not going to win this one, but you're you're acting like an idiot. And once you, you'll get, it only takes once to get caught." Well, I I come across the Canby Street Bridge every day and, mm-hmm. and then go up Smythe into downtown. And just in the last two weeks, they've put in a new bike lane oh, there yeah, in the curb lane. And, you know, I, I hope in the long run that it works out. But right now, nobody knows how it's supposed to function. And there's a lot of confused drivers and I think confused bicyclists about who, who has what right of way. Well, here's my theory on that. We're getting kind of off topic yep. from the concussions, but it's a good conversation is that when you segregate cyclists from the regular vehicle population, you're saying to them, you have separate rules. Mm-hmm. You don't need to follow the rules of the road. When I was a kid growing up, we had police officer Bob or whoever came to our school and said, you are a vehicle. You're not a motorized vehicle, but you're a vehicle on the road. Therefore, you have to obey all of the same signs and lanes and rules of the road that a motor vehicle has. But when you segregate cyclists, you're saying, well, those rules really don't apply to you, which is, I think, where where the problems happen. Yeah. And okay, I think, off my soapbox yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but bikes aren't amphibians, right? They no. have to follow the same rules. Yeah. Or, and I think also part of it is we all need to learn how to get along. I think there's a lot of animosity. we all anim- just get along? There's yeah. a lot of animosity between drivers and bicyclists these yeah. days. And, and I think it's, it's a matter of everybody learning, you know, what their role is and, and then trying to respect that. Well, I thought I'd just ask you uh, because you do see the, you know, the not so fortunate outcomes of all of these things. So back to uh, our main discussion today, brain injuries and concussions. Um, now, what if you have somebody listening to this who has had an accident and maybe the family members think that, you know, dad isn't the same or mom isn't the same after this and they may be improved, but they didn't improve all the way. What's your advice to them? Well, they should have a lawyer. Um if they've got a car accident, I mean, mm-hmm. they should definitely have a lawyer or any sort of in, in, you know, incident where they can seek uh, assistance. They should have a lawyer, but not only, I mean, you know, there's lawyers in the phone book. You can just, you know, if you have like a minor soft tissue injury, you, in my view, you probably don't actually need a lawyer. And I actually encourage people not to get one. But if you have a concussion or a suspected concussion, you do need a lawyer. You need a lawyer that has experience with these cases, hopefully one that's actually got some experience taking the cases to trial because... You know, you wouldn't want to go see an orthopedic surgeon that's never done a surgery. And that's common in your line of work, that there's lawyers that never go to trial, right? Unfortunately. Not, not in your office, but you have a much higher rate of success at trial than a lot of other firms. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say there's some lawyers that never go to trial. They certainly don't want to go to trial. They don't, 
you know, if they go, they're sort of forced there. We, we prepare every case like it will go to trial because we don't know. We don't know how the person's going to turn out. We don't know what the insurance company's position is going to be, and we don't know what our client wants or needs. Mm-hmm. So we prepare every case like it's going to go so we can sleep, sleep well at night. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure the clients uh, have much better outcomes than just settling early if they need to. Well, yes, and, and especially with, with concussive-type symptoms, you always want to make sure that that you're all better before you settle because if if a case is resolved and then a year down the road you realize that you know you're really not the same you haven't gotten back to the way you were it's too late you can't go and and undo that at least you can't 99.9 percent of the time well thank you very much gentlemen for coming in today scott stanley and kevin gurley from murphy batista in downtown vancouver in their ivory tower (laughs) <laughs> you said it, not me. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for being our guest today on The Law Show on CL650. I'm Zach Spencer, and we'll speak to you next time.